Well, good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, both at Brisbane at AIAQ Central at Holding Wedlock, uh, and also uh, wherever you are in the world on the web. Uh, thank you very much for coming here or tuning in this evening uh, for our latest in our fortnightly series, Making Transport Safer for All Travellers. Uh, we would have had Greg Hood last year. Uh, unfortunately, COVID made that uh, impossible. So I am delighted that we have him tonight. Uh, Greg is the uh, Australian Transport Safety Bureau Chief Commissioner. Uh, and uh, I'll just let you know a little bit about his, his history uh, before I um, hand over to him. He was appointed to the role of Chief Commissioner and Chief Executive Officer of the ATSB on 1 July 2016. In his time, he has overseen a number of significant transport safety investigations and report releases across the three modes of aviation, rail and maritime. He has also successfully transitioned the ATSB to its new role as a single national rail safety investigator. Queensland was a bit late to sign on. He got in there in the end, uh, bringing to a close a commitment to rail reform initiated by the Council of Australian Governments in 2009. Prior to his commencement with the ATSB, he had the role of Executive General Manager, Air Traffic Control with Air Services Australia. Uh, in his position, he was responsible for the management of over 1,300 air, uh, air traffic management staff, providing services for 11% of the world's surface. Australia is very, very significant um, uh, for more than 4 million flights annually from 28 air traffic control towers and facilities. He began his career as an air traffic controller in the Royal Australian Air Force in 1980, serving at locations throughout Australia and in the Middle East. In 1990, he removed, moved to the Civil Aviation Authority, predecessor to what is now Air Services Australia. And very relevantly to us, he is chair of the International uh, Transportation Safety Association. So a great honour both to Greg and to Australia that he chairs the international body. So tonight he's going to talk uh, about making transport safer for all, for, for all travellers, not just in relation to what the very interesting thing for all of us who love air traffic, air accident investigation programs, but indeed uh, what we're doing internationally in that respect as well, where we're very much the heavy lifters there with a number of other countries. So without further ado, I'll introduce Greg. Right, so firstly, thank you very much for the invitation and I'm delighted to be here. At the outset and in the spirit of reconciliation, I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners and custodians of the land who have walked on and cared for this land for thousands of years and their descendants who maintain their spiritual connection and the traditions. I thank them for sharing their cultures, spiritualities and ways of living for the land in this place we now call home and I pay respects to the elders past, present and emerging. And may we all continue to walk gently and respectfully together with each other. So today, my flight plan, if you like, is I'm gonna talk, talk a little bit about the personal journey. So uh, I wanted to make uh, this presentation interesting. Um, I think I've had a pretty interesting career. Um, I'm gonna update you on what we did last year during COVID. It was particularly challenging for us with the state border closures to get to accident sites, uh, to get to indigenous locations where there were accidents. And um, I thought you'd be interested on how we went about our business in spite of COVID-19. One of the most significant accidents we went to last year was the C-130 Hercules firefighting aircraft accident at Peak View near Kuma. Three American aviators were killed and um, it's the largest aircraft size of, uh, that we've ever been to. It's the longest accident site. It was 280 metres long as the aircraft tumbled up the hill. And it was the longest that the ATSB has ever been on an accident site. So um, after I've gone through 2020, I'm going to talk a little bit more specifically about that. Once again, in the international context, of course, they were uh, in an international company, Coulson's. Uh, working in Australia in the best interests of uh, the Australian people fighting the fires. Going to touch on ITSA. So as Paul alluded to, it's my second year as chair of the International Transportation Safety Association. I talk to, there's 18 members throughout the world, and I will talk to them every day, if, uh, maybe every other day this week. But um, 
uh, you know, so the head of the American NTSB, the Canadian TSB, um, whether it be the Finns or the um, Swedish or the Norwegians, the French, the English, um, New Guinea, New Zealand, um, there's always something happening where you might, it's a very lonely place sometimes as head of a safety investigation agency and being able to, uh, to, um, to touch base on various matters is very helpful indeed. And I'm going to also uh, do some personal reflections from five years in this job. Um, seen a lot of death and, um, and dealt with a lot of next of kin. And I'm going to talk a little bit about the qualities of people that work as crash investigators, if you like, for the ATSB. Happy with that? If so, we'll go on. So personal history, as, as Paul said, I joined the Air Force in 1980. I, I'd been to Flinders Uni. I was going to do a Bachelor of Education degree. I got two and a half years through the degree. and. Um, and I decided it was more exciting to join the Air Force and, uh, and see the world. So uh, I served at, uh, started training at Point Cook in, uh, in Melbourne, and then I went to East Sale in Gippsland. I volunteered and was sent to the Australian contingent of the Multinational Force and Observers in the Sinai Desert in 1983-84, where uh, um, I ran the uh, flight following cell of the Tactical Operations Centre. The most exciting night was the Rolf Harris concert. And, uh, and we were all uh, outside the Royal Paris concert. I had the pager. Uh, everyone was having a few beers that, that wasn't on call. And, and there was a, uh, a medical emergency in ambush in the, in the desert. And uh, we needed to find, um, uh, well, I got the page. I went down to the operations center. They said, there's people injured. We need to find two helicopters to medical evacuate the people from the Sinai Desert, which is Egypt, into Israel, where the medical facilities were. So um, I went down to see the boss and, uh, and there was only one sober Australian helicopter there. Um, and we needed two choppers. So uh, the boss and the XO of the, uh, of the, uh, of the unit uh, flew uh, with additional mitigators and uh, went to the middle of the desert, retrieved the, uh, the injured. And then I did the liaison between the Egyptian and the Israeli authorities because you can't just head straight across the border because uh, you've got service to air missile um, facilities along the border. So uh, the instruction to the Iroquois helicopter was, in fact, the two helicopters was to fly north over the Mediterranean to five miles to right in 070 and call the Israeli military control. So I was pleased I could pull it off and they got there safely. I also worked in Darwin, joint user airfield and towns with a joint user airfield. I joined Air Services Australia or the Civil Aviation Authorities it was then in 1990, and I worked for 17 years as an air traffic controller in um, Adelaide, Alice Springs. I taught at the University of Tasmania in Launceston, which is where we trained our air traffic controllers at the time. And then I was uh, I was sent to um, uh, Brisbane Centre here, and I was worked as a flight information region manager at Brisbane Centre from 98 uh, to 2001, uh, where I applied to uh, be the full-time manager uh, of Brisbane, and they sent me to Melbourne. So I spent, um, spent three years as the centre manager uh, for Melbourne for Air Services Australia, managing the whole southern FIR, including uh, Perth, Adelaide, Sydney and Melbourne. Uh, and then um, uh, the new CEO arrived and sent me to manage National Towers uh, out of Canberra. Uh, I then joined the Civil Aviation Safety Authorities, Executive Manager Operations. So I worked as the head of operations, so I did all the surveillance uh, myself and my team for Qantas and uh, Virgin and all the maintenance organisations, foreign carriers, etc., uh, for six years uh, before returning to Air Services Australia as Executive General Manager of Traffic Control. So I ran the, the Air Traffic Control Network for, uh, for four years and, and then I had heart disease. So uh, I was just telling Paul I, uh, uh, I was acting CEO of Air Services and uh, Air Services pay for their executives to have medicals. And executive medical. So I went into the to the executive medical, and um, the doctor said your cholesterol is nine point two. It's supposed to be below five point five. Are you feeling okay? And I said I go to the gym every morning. I get a bit of indigestion in the gym, but you know I still go every morning. And she said, well, that's probably angina. And <laughs> she said, have you got a family history? I said, yes. My, my dad had coronary artery disease, and most of that side of the family. And she said, you've got to have a. a see a cardiologist. So I went to a cardiologist next day and then uh, angiogram three days later and they, they popped a stent into, uh, into my left atrial descending. And, um, and I thought maybe I'd retire, uh, but then this gig came up at, uh, at the ATSB and 
the safety has been my passion for my entire working life. So um, I've been very fortunate to have been given the position and even more fortunate to have been elected by my colleagues in 2019 as uh, chair of the International Transportation Safety Association. And uh, I relinquished that uh, position about a fortnight to, uh, to Finlay. So anyway, that's the personal history. Caution. Um, so the presentation today does uh, have images of transport accidents. Uh, whilst all care has been exercised to ensure, you know, there's not graphic photos, so some attendees still may find the images uh, and one of the videos uh, disturbing and uh, in the interest of preventing any trauma, if you feel at all uncomfortable during the presentation, feel free to leave the room. Uh, there's no shame in that and to join us again at the completion of the presentation. So uh, last year began. Um, two brothers in their 60s from Toowoomba and they wanted to go to the Evans Head Air Show. And so they uh, they flew their Whitman tailwind aircraft down to Evans Head, but the weather uh, precluded the air show from going ahead. So they had to turn around and come back. So the weather was typical wet season type-ish weather. And uh, as they returned uh, from Evans Head direct to go to Boona, um, they encountered some bad weather. So. They diverted to casino and uh, sat on the ground for a while and then uh, believed that the weather was turning better. So they took off again and uh, just north of casino over the Tulum National Park, they entered uh, into the cloud and uh, spatial disorientation and loss of control and both of them were killed. So we deployed a team very early last year. So remember this is the COVID year uh, to the Tulum National Park uh, to investigate this accident. Then here, of course, closer to home in Moreton Bay, a couple took off from Redcliffe in the Cessna 182. Uh, something happened. Uh, he, he did, in fact, uh, the pilot uh, declare a mayday and then disappeared into, uh, into Moreton Bay and uh, investigation is uh, still ongoing in relation to, uh, to this accident. Uh, not much to go on. So uh, and once again, we don't make things up. If there's not much to go on and we haven't got the evidence, we'll say that in our eventual in our report. This is what I'm going to talk about in great detail. This is the accident side of the C-130 Hercules. We've seen how big the aircraft are. Um, so uh, you can see there uh, the left wing initially struck a tree uh, and then basically the, air, the aircraft in a uh, fireball uh, cartwheeled up, um, becoming destroyed as it cartwheeled up the 280 metres up the hillside. And uh, we'll talk about that one a little bit uh, more in depth as we, as we go. Uh, so we're now uh, into um, February, late February. Uh, there's a mid-air collision at Mangalore. So two pilots were departing Mangalore, a uh, flying instructor and a, a young Thai student. And uh, she was what they call under the hood. So she was doing an instrument flight test with the instructor. So she's sitting on the left-hand side of the aircraft and, uh, and she's under a hood. Uh, so she can't really see outside. And, uh, and so she's flying on instruments. And uh, the instructors, the uh, the other pilot on board, um, are doing a test. So they took off and, and headed south. At the same time, a Travel Air, which is another light aircraft with two pilots, had departed um, uh, from the Peninsula Aero Club, but I think it's Tyab, and on the way to Mangalore. And uh, and basically, they came together at about uh, 4,100 feet uh, just south of Mangalore Aero Aerodrome. The significance of that is that they were both what's called IFR, so instrument flight rules. So you have VFR, which is visual flight rules and instrument flight rules. So most pilots that fly around for fun are flying under visual flight rules. That means you can't go into cloud. Uh, you're always on the lookout for each other. But under instrument flight rules, um, you're always provided traffic services by your traffic control. So one of the interesting aspects of this accident is um, um, you know both of these aircraft were flying under instrument rules, and uh, and basically what happened uh, under air traffic controls guidance to uh, to result in this accident, and that that investigation is well advanced. I think the the draft will be with the um, ATSB commission next week, and that's just a, a photo of the site. So we we have um, one of my very proud achievements of the ATSB is I've, I've taken the demographic of the workforce from. Uh, 24% women to uh, 40. And uh, the lady on the left there is, uh, is qualified as a, a transport pilot license and also a PhD in human factors. So um, uh, she was the investigator in charge of the, uh, the Mangalore investigation. The day after the mid-air collision, 
um, in the same part of the world uh, was the uh, the Wallen uh, XPT train derailment. So it's the main passenger train traveling between Sydney and Melbourne. And um, in aviation, of course, we have what's called NOTAM. So they're notices to airmen. So before you depart a, a place, you, you get all the notices and it says, you know, watch out for the, the runway lights aren't working here or, um, you know, watch out for the crane in the undershoot of the runway. Well, in the rail, it's exactly the same. They're called train notices. And, um, and basically the a train notice had been issued uh, saying at Wallum, uh, be careful because you'll be going through the loop. Instead of going straight ahead, uh, you'll be going through the loop at Wallum, which means you need to exit the loop at 15 kilometers an hour. And uh, you need to exit the loop at 25 kilometers an hour. So, so this was a notice that was issued uh, by the train control um, team. And um, uh, so this XPT was doing 130 kilometers an hour as they entered the loop. Um, so the, as you can see, this is what the result was. So the power car uh, derailed and turned over. Uh, the passenger cars also turned over um, to some degree and the two people uh, in the lead power car were killed. So some of the questions that, are, that obviously we're asking, we're about to release an interim report um, in, the, in the next couple of weeks, uh, really is, is, did they have the notice? Um, had they read the notice? And uh, what procedures were in place for them to acknowledge that they'd received the notice? And, um, and if they had received it, what caused them to have some distraction that they forgot that they were gonna be going through the loop. So we're still working through the answers to all of those questions. But I put that in there because we don't just do aviation, it's rail and it's also marine. So now we're into uh, pretty much into lockdown. We're into March, 2020. And uh, there's, uh, it's, it's wet season still in North Queensland. And a Cessna 404 aircraft was operating a passenger charter flight from Cairns to Lockhart River and return. And uh, uh, the pilot uh, had uh, four others on board, so five people in total. And the weather was pretty shocking. And they did an instrument approach uh, over the water uh, to the aerodrome at Lockhart River. And uh, the weather was so bad, uh, they couldn't see the runway. So they did a go around, quite a safe maneuver, went out to do another instrument approach for the runway. And for whatever reason, the, the approach path was, uh, was flowing far too low. And this is what we call a, um, controlled flight into terrain. So actually the airplane flew into the sandbank around about four miles short of the runway and all on board were killed. Mm. So we, uh, we deployed a team that we could only get, so flights were starting to dry up. We could get as far as Cairns with Virgin. And, uh, and so we rely on, uh, on our colleagues and other government departments. So when we can't get any further, the Queensland Police Air Wing took us from Cairns to Lockhart River. As part of the, the COVID um, controls, we had to do a risk assessment. And we also had to seek the permission of the, um, the indigenous uh, head of the settlement to, to go and, into the settlement and stay there for a number of days. Some of the hazards, uh, just where you see the initial impact marks there uh, was where the four meter crocodile was controlling uh, up and down the beach, watching our people very carefully. <laughs> um, my team sent me a photo of, uh, here, here's the team on site. Uh, and they all had their backs to the water and I, I reminded them that we don't put our backs to the water in North Queensland. Um, <laughs> they, uh, they went to the settlement on, on the last night and came out the next morning and uh, they saw the crocodile tracks had come out of the, out of the water uh, uh, and up into the wreckage looking for, uh, looking for food. So uh, that's just some of the hazards that, uh, that we encounter every now and again in our work. Um, in May, we drove up to this accident from Canberra, so it was at Maitland. Uh, this is a, um, a home-built aircraft called a, an Osprey II, it's an amphibious aircraft. And uh, the owner of the air, aircraft wanted um, a test pilot to tell him what the stall speed was, you know, with flaps, the stall speed with that flap. So the, uh, it was an RAF uh, engineer that, uh, that did the test flying for, um, for the owner of the aircraft. and. Uh, uh, did all the right things. So whenever you do a test flight, you always do it over top of the aer aerodrome in case something goes wrong. And um, the people on the ground radioed the, uh, the pilot and said, listen, we, we see you trailing smoke. Um, subsequently, the engine failed on the aeroplane 
and in the turn back, it appears as if there was a loss of control in the collision terrain and the test pilot was killed. So going on to the ships, you, you may have seen this one, of course. Uh, so this is the APL England. They departed Ningbo in China, bound for Sydney, uh, loaded with 3,161 containers. Um, and, uh, and basically, the, it's a Singapore flagship uh, managed by CMA CGM International Shipping Company. And uh, the master was informed of a change of destination from Sydney to Melbourne. And, uh, and basically, they've been at, say, at sea for 14 days. And uh, the master received the weather advice saying that there was a low pressure system and high swells. You may have seen East Coast lows are quite prevalent in uh, certainly south of here, between here and Sydney. Uh, with swells of five to six metres developing off the New South Wales coast. So the, the master monitored those forecasts and, uh, and basically uh, they, they had a slight um, engine problem, uh, which resulted in uh, a significant roll uh, to the aircraft, sorry, the aircraft, to the ship, and uh, a number of containers were lost uh, uh, overboard. Some of the problems with losing containers like this on ships are um, some of them sink to the bottom which is a hazard for um, the prawn fishing industry. The nets get uh, snagged on the, on the containers and other containers uh, sit just below the water line. And so they present quite a hazard to shipping. And a number of these containers also washed up on shore with their contents. So that investigation is almost complete. This one was interesting. So once again, getting, getting people to broom uh, during the, particularly during the West Australian state border closures was a challenge, but we managed to get to, to Broome. Uh, the pilot and owner of the helicopter uh, was taking uh, his 12 year old daughter, another 12 year old girl and a 24 year old female passenger on a flight. Um, it was uh, hangered, if you like, uh, just to the north of the airport, about three miles north of Broome Airport in an industrial estate. And uh, basically, it came down as you could see. Two were killed, the pilot and uh, uh, one of the twelve-year-old girls were both killed. The others were better back into Perth. Um, it wasn't until we got there we, we, we assumed it was some kind of error and collision in the industrial estate there, and uh, we uh, we asked for the CCTV footage from some of the industrial estate hang hangers or buildings, and uh, quite clearly we could see the helicopter take off. And then about 100 feet, the whole two and a half feet of the tail fell off. Um, so what we call the tail empennage. Uh, it's the tail rotor, uh, the tail rotor gearbox, and the, the tail empennage itself all just fell off the helicopter and, uh, and basically it came straight down from 100 feet, uh, killing two on board. So that's uh, incredibly unusual um, for a helicopter. And this one was 292 hours old. Helicopter, so a brand new, brand new Robinson 44 helicopter. So uh, we're still working on that one as well. And this is a very frustrating one for us: is wire strikes. Once again, this pilot had done all the right things. He was going out to do uh, agricultural spraying, had a map, had the power line marked on the map. The map, you know, was on his lap. Uh, but uh, um, you know, what we call human factors: a loss of concentration or a momentary. Uh, lapse or a, a distraction of some sort. Uh, he seems to uh, have forgotten about the power line and uh, struck the power line, the helicopter came down and the pilot was killed. Uh, uh, where are we now? We're in uh, November. Um, you may have seen in the, uh, in the news a flying training company called Soar Aviation, uh, training flying students in Australia. Uh, they had headquarters in Bankstown, Mangalore, Moorabbin. There was a training flight conducted doing some air work at Bathurst, and then they went on to a private airfield uh, near Orange, a place called Carcor. Did a touch and go. Something's happened in the touch and go, and as, uh, as they took off again, they've lost control of the airplane, and, uh, and both the flying instructor and the student were killed. And then I think uh, we took two to go, I think at the end of the year in December, another Robinson 44 helicopter uh, doing flying training out of Goulburn, an instructor and a student. They, uh, they tracked um, due east out of Goulburn to do some air work and uh, we're still looking at what happened in that one, but so both of those people were killed. And then that was the final one for the year, which was a, a light aircraft uh, taking off from Serpentine in WA. Um, so he landed again and then lost control in landing and, uh, and was killed as well. So that's kind of the work that we did last year during COVID or some of it. 
Uh, just thought it would be useful to, to kind of highlight the work that we do. Our investigators have a variety of backgrounds. You know, some of them are, are pilots, and some of the aerospace engineers, licensed aircraft maintenance engineers, human factors specialists, ships captains, um, and uh, and rail uh, drivers and rail signal experts. Uh, so most of our people come from the transport industry. So I'm going to talk a little bit more about the loss of the large air tanker C-130 on the 23rd of January 2020 near Peak View at Cooma. So at 12 o'clock, a Hercules uh, departed RAF Base Richmond, and uh, the mission was to drop retardant at a fire near a place called Adaminabee in the Snowy Mountains. So I'm board with three US citizens, two pilots and a flight engineer. Uh, the owner was Coulson's, and they were contracted to the Rural Fire Service of New South Wales for the fire season. Uh, the registration, November 134, Charlie Golf, and the course line, Bomber 134. So on arrival at Adam Inipi, the crew determined there was too much smoke to conduct a retardant drop, and it was uh, significantly windy from the northwest. And they proceeded to a secondary target identified by the RFS, which was at peak view. And uh, it was called the Good Good Fire, and it was threatening a koala and kangaroo a wildlife sanctuary. So the crew conducted a number of surveillance passes first, and on the final pass, the, the aircraft um, dropped a line of retardant at approximately 200 feet. And following the drop, a video taken by the personnel shows the aircraft in the left turn, entering or maneuvering behind smoke for about 12 seconds before impacting terrain. So I'm gonna show you the video. Uh, it's available on YouTube, so I'm, I'm not uh, breaching any uh, evidential you know, protections, but uh, you might find this interesting. So you can see the Hercules C-130 running in, it's about 200 feet AGL. You can hear the wind, how windy it is. In a second, uh, you'll see it drop the line of retardant like that, and then do the left turn in and behind the smoke. It's turned into a 50 knot tailwind. Meteorological conditions were quite severe for any aircraft. Just on the left side of the screen now, you can see the impact just in the tree. So that was uh, the accident sequence itself. So from an ATSB point of view, it's, it's always interesting when these things happen. Sometimes they happen in the middle of the night and sometimes they happen in the middle of the day. So the Director of Aviation Safety at Castle rang me at two o'clock and said, have you heard about the C-130 accident? And uh, I said, no, but we, uh, we convened our first meeting at 14.30. I told the Deputy Prime Minister at 14.45, I, I rang the RAF and said, we haven't got any C-130 Hercules expertise, so I might be looking for a licensed aircraft maintenance engineer that uh, has expertise in engine and airframes. And in fact, the, the RAF said, absolutely. And they, they flew a, a guy down, a reservist down from Harvey Bay, uh, the Kerma to join us. Um, I told the USA and Canada because I wasn't sure whether Coulson's at the time was a Canadian or a United States company. And then we, uh, we had a second meeting. We deployed, we finalised our deployment team. Uh, we discussed uh, the situation with Coulson's, with the Royal, Flying Sur uh, Royal Fire Service and New South Wales Police. We put a protection order on the site saying, under our legislation, you can't touch anything or do anything with that aircraft until, uh, until we say you can except for the removal of uh, um, the pilots and the engineer. And then uh, we had a final meeting late afternoon and we met the police at Kuma Town Hall the next day for the briefing. We, we sent nine people, including the RAF investigator to the site. Uh, I also went. Um, so when the team, when we got there after meeting with the police and the RFS, the team peeled off and went to the accident site. And I went to the Oval at a place called New Morella where there was a media contingent almost as large as I've ever seen uh, outside broadcast bands and journalists and uh, cameras. And uh, so I did a doorstop conference then and I did a press conference for them in the ensuing days. Uh, and then we started our work. So the first thing we do is we make the site safe. Um, in this particular case, uh, there's lots of things that can kill you in an aircraft accident, including um, pressurized containers such as wheel struts, oxygen containers. And uh, we weren't sure of the carcinogenic properties of the retardant at the time, lots of aviation turbine fuel, 
um, and then of course burnt trees were in the middle of the bushfire area. Um, so we spent quite some time, but the best part of a day and a half, making things safe for people to work at. Uh, we did 3D drone mapping. Uh, we did recreation work. So the RFS gave us a helicopter and we put the GPS waypoints in it and uh, we did the recreation with an underslung 8K camera, cin cinematographic quality camera. So we could capture the, uh, the replay of the flight. Uh, we mapped and tagged evidence, removed the power plants, gearboxes, propellers, recovered instruments. Um, and uh, we finished our work on about the 14th of February. But we also were evacuated from site three times by the RFS in the middle of the bushfire zone saying, you've got to go back to Cooma. Um, you know, we, uh, we can't guarantee your safety. So we always comply with the emergency services directions. And then I facilitated several visits by the Coulson family and this Australian operations manager, the families. So it's quite often the scene of an accident that the next of kin will want to come to the accident site and see where their loved ones' lives have been lost. Um, and we always facilitate that when we can. So in this particular case, the Coulson family who owned the company, the accident happened on Thursday. The Coulson family came out on the Sunday in the United States. And then on the following Wednesday, um, the, the pilot's wife, 13 year old son, and 72 year old father uh, came to the accident site. And, uh, and I hosted that visit. And the uh, first officer's uh, wife came as well. And basically, we, we gave them a safety briefing saying, Here's what we know and then provided them with an opportunity to walk along the, the accident site. Quite poignantly, um, you know, we paused at the cockpit where, um, where the three orange flags where the crew had been removed and, um, and obviously paused for, for a moment for reflection there. Uh, obviously, lots of people like the coroners, uh, the insurer, uh, representative from Rolls-Royce, the Defence Flight Safety Bureau, we, we facilitated as many visits to to the, uh, to the scene as, as we could possibly cater for. To show you a few photos of the site. So the two police on the right hand side there, they are the disaster victims identification team. So um, they were the ones, and, and these people are very special people. They're the ones that go to accidents and, uh, and remove the deceased from, from the wreckage. Uh, and of course, it's a, it's a fairly grisly job. And, uh, and, and these people are just so good at what they do. And, uh, they removed the body with such care and respect. And, um, and they stayed on site to help us for a couple of days as well. And that's uh, our team. Once again, the uh, investigator in charge of this one, that's Laura, second from the left. She's an aerospace engineer, graduate of Monash, and um, one of our finest investigators. That's the DBI police we're talking about, Laura. Um, this is an example. I'll just put that up there to show you how much assistance we get from emergency services. So the crash site's just off to the the well, left hand side there, but the police set up this marquee for us uh, with uh, two eskies in it, a generator, which is over here, a, a portable VHF um, Telstra tower. So we had uh, comms back to, uh, to um, where we needed it. This is a police van they left there. And in fact, when the next of kin came out, the, uh, the videos had just started to surface of the, the accident sequence. And they said, we want to see the videos. So we, you know, it's not for us to say you can't see the video. So we took them into the van and showed them the, uh, what you've just seen then. Um, toilets. So we pretty well looked after them. The, uh, the RFS gave us, um, they sent us an arborist to help us cut down some of the burnt trees. And, um, and basically we, we got great cooperation from the other, other emergency services. It's just some more sites of the burnt trees are in here around the wreckage site. That's the, the, where the aircraft wings first struck the ground. So uh, um, as you saw, the aircraft was kind of wallowing in the smoke there. And, uh, and basically it, it went into that tree uh, on the left wing, uh, pretty much like that. And uh, the reason we could tell that was the first impact point is just up the hill and you'll see the markers in a minute was the red navigation light glass from the, uh, the left nav light of the, of the C-130. So as you look up the hill there, you can see that those little markers are uh, what marks the, uh, the glass, the, the red glass where um, just after the left wing tip had gone in. That's the, the site from the air. Um, I put that looking helicopter, as you can see, there's not much left of the big airplane. And as I said, that's the, uh, you can see the underslung camera from the RFS chopper that uh, helped us do the recreation plots. 
It's uh, the RAF Warrant Officer who is an expert in engine airframes out examining some of the debris that blew up against a fence. And that's uh, the only recognisable bit of the aeroplane that uh, was left on the accident site. Mm. You actually see the tank there, that's the, uh, just a, coming out of the tail, that's that's the retardant tank. So two red recognisable bits, if you like, the retardant tank, and they have the uh, orange retardant and, uh, and the tail of the aircraft. Uh, we did, in fact, recover the cockpit voice recorder. So, you know, you're always saying uh, Dr. David Warren uh, invented the black box uh, in the late 1950s, great invention, and, uh, and quite sophisticated now. There's, there's two of them. One's called the flight data recorder, which records the parameters uh, in the aircraft. The other's the cockpit voice recorder, which records all the conversation in the cockpit. There was no flight data recorder on this aeroplane, but the cockpit voice recorder was recovered from inside the tail. And we're very excited. We rushed it back to Canberra. The engineers uh, did the um, preparation, played perfectly, but it played perfectly from a flight about six months previous to the United States. So what they've got is a, they've got a, a G switch. So when you have a hard landing, it actually, the G switch goes off, it isolates it so it's not recorded over. And so that hadn't been reset. Um, so we, we didn't have the data from the accident flight. So that would have been very useful for us. Just a few more shots of the, the wreckage. So we took the engines, the gearboxes, the propellers, uh, transported to by the army to a secure facility at Richmond for detailed examination. It was all done for free. It's normally we have to pay for that bushfire assist uh, scheme um, that let us leverage off the army. Uh, we had some aerospace experience and qualified medical doctors out to, to look at the autopsies of the three. Uh, we had a look at the history of the C-130. Uh, we released a prelim and, and interim report. We're still working with Bureau of Meteorology. And in fact, last week we, we went to the RAF simulator at Richmond and uh, and we flew the C-130J simulator and the people at the RAF uh, created the conditions uh, exactly as they were at the, uh, the crash site. And that's been very useful for us. And we're almost uh, finishing up on that one. That's the cockpit voice recorder being removed from the wreckage uh, by the guys at full PPE crash site. So ITSA, um, just briefly about ITSA. So it's a member organization of 18 advanced um, safety investigation agencies around the world. Uh, it's about 20 years old and it's the head or the chairman of, um, of each of those agencies. So the National Transportation Safety Board of the United States, Transport Safety Board of Canada, etc. So, um, you know, most of them cover uh, aviation, marine, railways. So the United States also cover gas pipeline and underground infrastructure. Uh, I won't go through the aims too much. I mean, sharing of information is, is the most important thing. Um, we had some debate this week about um, when we have a draft report about an aircraft accident, uh, we by and large send it to the next of kin of the pilot that might be killed. And there's a big debate running about do you give it to the next of kin of the passengers as well? So, um, so that's where I've been talking to my international colleagues this week about what they do and everybody kind of does something different. Um, it really is in crucial where we're all no blame transport safety investigators. Although I have to say the, um, my Russian colleagues because uh, they're part of the association, um, they kind of work in a little bit of a different way because uh, their regulator is so strong. So for example, in Australia, if you find during the course of an investigation that pilot may not have been appropriately licensed, um, then obviously that goes into our report. Uh, in Russia, that gets reported to the regulator and the regulator takes appropriate action as they see fit. So uh, it's not quite uh, the same in every state. Can you just explain why it's no blame? What's the reason? Sure. So um, our, our, under, our, under our Act, you know, Transport Safety Investigation Act 2003, it specifically says that, that my function is to investigate transport accidents uh, with a view to preventing any recurrence. And so in actual fact, an ATSB investigation can't be used in a court of law. Uh, you know, the police have to go and gather their own evidence if you like. So um, it's, um, it's interesting to see the trends in Scandinavia currently where a no blame transport investigation started in, in, uh, in aviation. 
um, but they've actually now morphed into the medical industry in Scandinavia. So uh, because it's seen to be reasonably unpalatable for police to be marching into the hospitals to question nurses and doctors, um, the, uh, the medical side of, uh, of Scandinavia has adopted the no blame transport safety investigation and to say, well, what we're really interested in is to find out what happened and why to stop a recurrence, not uh, to, to pursue a prosecution. And so my colleagues in Finland, in Norway, and in Sweden, uh, in the transport safety investigation arena are now doing no blame safety investigations in transport, but also uh, in the medical area. So can I answer the question? Um, and here's just an example I thought of, 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 I'm sorry about the writing so small, but Lion Air, Boeing 737 MAX um, crashed out of Jakarta. Um, on the 29th of October 2018, and uh, everyone on board was killed. So the very first thing that the head of the NTSC did in Indonesia is he rang me up saying, uh, help, uh, sort of said, we don't need help. You know, you've got very good capability, you've got very good people. Uh, but all he could see, of course, being an American aircraft, uh, Boeing aircraft built and designed in the United States, all he could see was the FAA, the NTSB, and Boeing, GE, uh, and every, everyone else coming across the Pacific to uh, to Jakarta, um, and uh, they just wanted an honest broker in the middle. Uh, they wanted the Australians there, and, and so we uh, we actually assisted the Indonesians with the download of the flight data recorder for that accident. So it's an actual fact we we pretty clued up on what happened not long after the flight data recorder data was downloaded, and then we went back for, for the cockpit voice record. It actually buried itself in the deep into the mud as it, as it impacted the water and uh, took some weeks to recover when we went back. And what I said to my people, I'm, I'm very happy for you to go back and help them retrieve the cockpit voice recorder, help them get it ready to play. Um, but we're very careful about um, extended trauma or secondary trauma um, for the people. And I, I actually, unless you need to listen to somebody's last seconds of life, then, uh, then you shouldn't have to do that. And so I'm happy for the Indonesians to listen to that and do the transcripts and stuff, but I, uh, because we weren't members of the core investigation team, I, I kept our people out of the to the, uh, to that. We have had um, some experience of trauma in ATSB over the years where people listen to the last seconds of somebody's life um, in the cockpit voice recording, and uh, we don't actually put that on the network anywhere. We, we never see or hear anything from the ATSB in the last seconds of someone's life, um, and we're very careful about how we extend uh, assistance uh, through psychological processes for people that may have some kind of stress event in that space. Um, personal reflections in, in, my, in my roundup, basically, you know, for my five years in this role, it's been fascinating. It's been a great privilege to lead this agency. Um, you know, the second week in the job, I went with Minister Darren Chester to Malaysia to call off Australia's involvement in the search for Malaysia Airlines MH370. Um, when I got to the ATSB, we were very um, focused on, on these are rail investigators, these are aviation investigators, these are marine investigators. Uh, well, I couldn't use resources across the organisation. I felt very strongly that the, the core skill set was to be an investigator. It didn't matter what mode you came from. So we work in multimodal um, teams now. Um, there were declining numbers. So in, in government uh, you know, appropriations, uh, 10 years before, we had 135 people. And um, for small agencies, it was what's called an um, efficiency dividend. So every year they just gave you uh, less money and you expected to be more efficient. But what that resulted in small agencies, 135, 132, 129, 126, and we were down to 93. Uh, and I thought, well, another 20 years we won't have any left. So um, anyway, government was very good and they uh, addressed the declining numbers and took them back up to 110. Changed over 60% of the workforce, and as I said, improved the uh, demographic in the workforce. Um, we mapped the competencies of an investigator. We implemented cognitive testing for recruitment. Um, interns from ANU, as I said, I talked to the head of engineering at ANU, and I said, anyone that's interested in working for us? And she said, uh, one of the young kids is really bright, and he's selling televisions at JB Hi-Fi. And uh, so I went and met with him and said, how would you like to recover burnt microchips from uh, you know, GPSs that are Come out of airplanes that have crashed. And, uh, 
you know, pay you more than JB Hi-Fi. So, um, <laughs> so we started with interns and then he liked us so much that this guy stayed with us and as an undergrad and now he's, he's got his degree, he's graduated and staying with the APSB. So I think there's a lot to be said for interns and I know there's a couple in the room here now. Um, and uh, and I kind of that, that helps balance the age demographic as well. RMIT, we've partnered with RMIT as a deliverer of, of uh, accredited um, tertiary training and investigation, and also not only for the ATSB, but, but for industry. Uh, got some really good working relationships with defence, police, etc. I've opened up new offices and I've replaced the core enterprise system. So I'm kind of ready uh, on 30th of June to hand over to my replacement. So yeah, nothing left to do. Um, so I have to say that, that uh, the, the great privilege has been, it's one of the most remarkable workforces I've had the privilege to lead. Our, our team are incredibly intelligent. Um, they're ready to deploy 24-7, 365 anywhere in Australia and in, in Indonesia and PNG. Um, people are with us. A lot of them are so bright, they could be earning a lot more money elsewhere. But the altruism, you know, they're wanting to do good, they're wanting to, you know, take lessons of an accident and, and do something with it, uh, drives them to stay with us, which, uh, which I think is incredible. Evidence-based, we treat each other with respect. Um, you know, we have no tolerance for, uh, um, for anything other than respectful behaviour in the workforce. Uh, we've got innovators, you know, we've got, a, we've got a whole fleet of drones now. We do mapping, 3D mapping of the aircraft accident sites, rail accident sites, marine accident sites. Um, GoPro 360 cameras, which you can stitch together with the GoPro stuff and, and recreate the accident site. So, you know, even once you've left, you can on your screen, go back and have a look at where that wing touched there or um, any aspect that you, you may have forgotten. Uh, we look after each other. We, we did a uh, survey because I was worried about critical incident stress. We've got people that have gone to 80, 90 aircraft accidents uh, or rail accidents, marine accidents in a row, seen a lot of people deceased and, and then, you know, uh, um, and continuously. And, and of course, it's always different every accident and uh, some of that stays with you. So I was really worried about post-traumatic stress disorder and critical incident stress management, but I got the University of South Australia in to do a psychosocial survey, and they said that in actual fact, if people leverage off each other really well to manage that critical incident stress. Um, in fact, what, what the literature says is that, is that uh, people will be more stressed by day-to-day -day experiences in the workplace, you know, like having your colleague disagree with your work or your manager send your work back to you and that sort of stuff. So uh, I was very relieved some aspects of that. Uh, very much empathy, we cooperate closely and we see an experience tragedy as well as it gets. And in my mind, I went to the accident at Essen where they went into the shopping center and uh, you know, four American golfers were killed and the pilot was killed. It, it, it basically, uh, the left wing hit, hit their conditioning duct, it swung around, went up in a fireball and it landed in the car park of the uh, DFO shopping center at Essen. So we, we deployed from Canberra, I went with the team, and uh, we got a, because the Tullamarine freeway's closed, so we got a police escort to the accident site. And um, and basically the, the five charred uh, um, deceased were still on the wreckage. And I watched the DVI tell them as soon as the DVI team worked to uh, remove with such care and respect the bodies from the wreckage. And then of course I watched and worked with our people uh, as, uh, as they worked in the wreckage all week. And then at the end of the week, uh, Derek and Kerry, two of our employees, uh, they put on their best clothes and they went into the Hyatt Hotel uh, and, uh, and uh, basically interviewed the four widows uh, from the United States that uh, would have been uh, a tragedy. So to be working in the wreckage for a week and then to go and meet for the next of kin, I think it's being asked for, uh, for people. And I have my much respect for uh, the people that work for the ATSB. So I think that really is pretty much on time. And um, now I'm happy Precious. to take uh, facilitated questions. Okay, well, um, the prerogative of the chair is to ask the first question, uh, and uh, so the, uh, we'll grab some from the audience as well. And if you're online, if you can send them through, uh, and um, Lily uh, will um, uh, will relay them to me. Uh, one of the things, though, that Greg, I wanted to ask you about is uh, systemic uh, investigations, and even uh, you know, one of my chief bugbears is someone who flies on airplanes constantly and loves aviation is, for example, we've seen um, that information or those instances where people are evacuating a jet airliner in an emergency and they're all taking 15 bags and five laptops and, and everything else at the same time. 
I know that's a cause of great concern and what are the solutions to doing it. Um, can you tell me a little bit about, tell us a little bit about those sort of more broader uh, investigations where you're looking at cross accidents uh, in particular? Sure. Um, that's a great question. So there's the what and then there's the why. So you'll find quite often the regulators will look for the what uh, because they, they need to know what happened so they can look for a prosecution. What we tend to look for is the why. So, so why did it happen and, and, uh, and, and look for the factors that can stop it happening again. And we talk about systemic investigations. We, I'll use one in rail. We've just released one into Queensland Rail here uh, where um, uh, we, uh, there was a, what's called a signal pass of danger out here at Bowen Hills and, and the driver passed a, basically you go through a, a red light um, and, uh, and then you rely on other uh, system defences to bring you to a stop in this particular case. It was the, the train control network that uh, contacted the driver saying stop, you're about to cross another line. And in fact, there was a, another train on that other line. So uh, what we did there is, is obviously there's a whole lot of stuff to look at from, uh, from recruitment uh, to training uh, and, uh, and as we started to go, and it's a very laborious task sometimes. So we went back through the training records of this particular driver and um, some things piqued our interest and we had a look at the driver's uh, method of competency. So he, he completed the written exam and, um, uh, and, uh, and uh, got 100% and, uh, and we looked at the, uh, the answer sheet and uh, there was an error on the answer sheet that was also transcribed directly into, into his answers. So we then did a further sample and we found another 50, um, basically, of uh, the fact that they'd all uh, transcribed the same thing. So, uh, so when, we, when we dug a bit deeper, we, we actually had a look at the, um, the method of competency uh, assessment for, for Queensland Rail for, mm -hmm. for this driver, and we just published that report. And of course, um, we, we didn't say that uh, all the trained drivers in Queensland Rail are competent. And what we said is that, is that the method of competency uh, process needs to be examined. So that's kind of a systemic example of, you know, you go back and you look at training, you look at recruitment, then you look at uh, all the aspects that can uh, prevent the occurrence uh, from that kind of accident. Yeah, but SPADs, I mean, rails are, rails is, is cool, probably no rails are, um, you know, different. It's probably not quite as advanced in aviation in terms of uh, systemic investigations. Uh, but in aviation, of course, we've been doing systemic investigations for a lot longer. A uh, question from the floor. Any any questions uh, from uh, Brisbane? Greta. Uh, thank you, Greg. It's a very interesting presentation. And um, from selfish reasons, my question pertains to Indonesia because um, it, it's it's a certainly an area of expertise for me, defence and foreign policy issues. But in terms of um, aviation safety in Indonesia, you know, I, I remember back to the 2007 Job Jakarta Garuda crash. I know Garuda has significantly improved its its safety record, but we know there's been Lion Air. We know there's the Air Asia flight um, out of Surabaya, and one of my friends actually is a Cathay Pacific pilot. And I said, Jim, I said, what happened with the Air Asia flight? I mean, they they flew through a storm. You know, his former um, I think F16 pilot, the Indonesian Air Force pilot. And I said, well, what's happened? He said, well, we wouldn't fly through storms. We'd fly around them. And I just wonder if you can comment, um, particularly perhaps on that Surabaya Air Asia flight, if you had any uh, you know, exposure engagement with that, that incident about, uh, about kind of weather events and, and the training and decisions that pilots are, are making, but particularly their training and, and, and capability with respect to like those wet season kind of events. So I'll go back a step. Uh, so my former employer and the Civil Aviation Safety Authority, we actually um, saw three significant events uh, by Garuda in, in my first year of employment there. Uh, one was in Darwin, where the aircraft appeared to be lining up to land on the highway. Uh, and then there were two in Perth, uh, one where the aircraft uh, attempted twice to land on a displaced threshold. So there were men and equipment in the displaced threshold on the aircraft. Uh, despite being advised, still tried to kind of land on top of them. And then the third one was uh, basically they turned down the volume and they were uh, below the lower safe altitude and uh, we couldn't contact the aircraft because they, uh, they turned down the volume of the, of the receiver. So three significant events for Garuda. So we, we actually sent a senior delegation to Jakarta and we met with the head of the regulator and we met with the head of the airline. And, uh, you know, it was kind of a fairly uh, tough conversation to say, well, this is kind of not the, 
the kind of safety record we're looking for in Australia. And to their credit, and I've flown Garuda many times since, to their credit, that airline have proved their controls. They also opened up opportunities for um, Australian regulators uh, who are flying office inspectors to travel jump seat on the aircraft at any time on any flight. Um, so they were very keen to, you know, to show you know, in a transparent way that uh, they got the message uh, in relation to, to their safety. I'm not specifically uh, across the Surabaya accident to any great degree, um, but we, we have got a very important role as the, the transport safety watchdog. And, um, you know, we did have um, an incident in an A330 recently of an Asian registered airline that had an engine failure near Alice Springs. So um, the long and short of it is um, they um, had an engine problem. They retarded the throttle, you know, said low oil pressure. They retarded the throttle. They talked about it. And then they kind of talked themselves into the fact that, um, uh, that it was an indication problem and they put the throttle back again and then the engine seized. So now you've got a twin engine airplane, an A330, large airplane, full of passengers traveling from, um, from Sydney to, uh, Southeast Asia, and um, of course, uh, one of the golden rules of aviation is uh, what happens when you have an engine failure, land at the nearest civil aerodrome. And so, the nearest civil aerodrome, from that perspective, is Alice Springs uh, down here. Um, but uh, the crew elected to, uh, to turn around and they bypassed Alice Springs, and then, of course, the next civil aerodrome was Adelaide, and bypassed Adelaide, and, uh, and they went to Melbourne. So, um, we've called that out, uh, and in fact, um, you know, that, that's our role. Um, we're, we're not a, a regulator, so we haven't got any punitive uh, provisions in our legislation, but uh, of course you know, that does, you know, our investigations are brought to the attention of the regulators and, um, and of course uh, you know, we, we do several of those where we, we call out that kind of um, concern and, uh, and then it's up to regulators and others to take appropriate action. Great, your question as an ex horizon guy. What's your thought on autonomous uh, trains that could run in Queensland for any of the coal mines? Uh, we're talking to a Tesla driver. <laughs> you know, so I, I love my automation. Um, but, you know, and it's a good thing. And, and one of the reasons I went to Tesla, I, I wanted to learn. And, yeah, I got the cheap next Tesla. I got the, the lowest model you could possibly get, Model 3. Um, but, you know, there are traps to automation. And, and what we've seen uh, in some rail accidents recently and we've got a runaway cement train in um in devonport so it was loading cement and uh and it was one of those it was an automated train but it, it relied on the, on the you know basically the operator um, working a remote control device and um so i've gone the system failure and the train left the station and uh so we've got a runaway train in, uh, in northern <laughs> tasmania and it, um, it was diverted to, into the port of Devonport by Tasmanian police and Tasrail. And eventually it hit the barrier and, um, and basically we're still doing that investigation. So automated systems, fantastic, um, but they're subject to uh, software issues. And, and obviously we're, we're having a pretty good look at that one. We had another runaway train, obviously, and um, iron ore train in the Northwest. And, and that, uh, whilst that was a driver, train that was a smaller you know we, we've had a few runaway trains lately and um so automation comes with its uh it's just leading in that do you also look at uh, an activist getting into a software and trying to stop or move the train away to create problems has that been looked at? that's a very good question so so it's interesting so even in unlawful interference even if it's an airplane unlawful interference ATSB won't be investigating that that belongs to the uh, judicial authority. So, uh, yeah, if it's the same in all the train, we, we won't be looking at that. But uh, smarter thank people you. than I am in the side of the world will be looking at that. Thank you. Okay, Greg. Well, thanks very much for that. Um, as uh, part of your uh, our thanks to you, you get the wonderful uh, opportunity to be a free year's membership, honorary membership of uh, AIAQ. So, whenever you're here or online, you, uh, you want to listen to other people, you can do that. And uh, uh, what a wonderful speech and contribution tonight. Uh, uh, just uh, I really very educational and also, of course, you know, Australia's position with respect to other countries. Uh, we're big enough to be highly competent, but small enough to be very cognizant of the cultural issues with uh, with other countries. Uh, 
Um, you know, and can I just say that personally, I think one of the issues very early on with both cultures whereby deference to authority is very important or um, civil aviation and its roots in military aviation where hierarchies are very important is something that aviation had to come to grips with very early on uh, to actually educate people. If the captain makes a wrong call, you've actually got to, you know, call it out. And indeed, that's what everything about boardroom governance is about now. So aviation so often leads what happens uh, in so many other areas. Uh, just in terms of uh, what we've got coming up, um, uh, our next uh, our next talk uh, is on the 20th of May um, with the Honourable uh, Ted O'Brien, the member for Fairfax, and it will be uh, he'll be talking about China, and uh, he'll be saying how and talking about how China, how Australia and China might resolve our differences uh, and the particular issues that we have uh, we with we have with each other, and explaining some of the context behind how China sees the world. And, and how Australia and, and its position with respect to China might might um, might uh, advance uh, our situation whilst retaining our sovereignty. So that will be a very interesting contribution as well, and indeed chaired by Dr. Carl Hins from Holding Wedlock, who is indeed a China specialist himself. So a very interesting one. So thank you very much, everybody, for tuning in tonight. Uh, it's been a great contribution, as are all things. I've certainly enjoyed it. Uh, and uh, thank you again and look forward to uh, uh, you tuning in or being here in the future.